everybody and welcome back to Rain and Pores. Today's video is all about pigments, mica powders and dyes. What are they, how do I use them and what is the difference between them? So to start off with, let's start off with a couple of definitions. Pigments are mostly insoluble, finely ground powders that can be used to colour water-based, oil-based or plastic-based solutions. So a water-based solution could be acrylic paint, oil-based paint or you could have your plastic-based solutions which include resin. They provide colour to substances by reflecting and refra refracting certain wavelengths of light. So when you see a pigment that is blue, it is absorbing all of the wavelengths of light on the colour spectrum and only reflecting out the ones that are blue and that is what we perceive as colour. These pigments do not dissolve into the substrate they're being dissolved into, the solvent, and they do not become part of the chemical solution. They make a suspension. So the difference between a solution and a suspension, a solution means that whatever is dissolved into it, for example sugar into water, becomes part of that chemical bond. So a suspension on the other hand is where the particles being mixed into the mixture do not chemically bond with whatever it is they're being dissolved in. So I use the example of sugar and water because if you stir sugar into a cup of hot water and you put a lid on that and you let it sit for a couple of months airtight, those sugar crystals will not dissolve out because you will not get a layer of sugar crystals because it is dissolved, it is soluble in water. However, if you took something like dirt and dissolved that in water and made it into mud and did the same thing, capped it off and left it for a couple of months, eventually all of those particles of dirt and silt and sediment would settle out on the bottom and you would have pure clean water on top. That is a suspension. So pigments will form a suspension, they will not dissolve into whatever it is you're mixing them into. Dyes on the other hand usually will do that and they are made that way. They are made to dissolve in the solvent that they are being mixed into. So most pigments are synthetic these days, we can manufacture nearly any colour that we want. However, in past times they were mostly organic. So things like ochre, umber and sienna are basically dirt. You can have your azo colours which are made from organic content which make up your yellows, oranges and reds and also copper can make thalocyanine colours uh, such as blues and greens. Like I said nowadays most of those are manufactured in a lab, we have the technology to do that um, and as recently as 2016 a brand new blue pigment was discovered which hasn't been done for nearly 100 years. Generally most pigments now are inorganic. We don't usually use any that we find in nature. Fluorescent and neon pigments or colours are almost always dyes that have been changed chemically to form a powder. They've been rendered insoluble, as in they will not dissolve into your medium by a chemical process and that's why sometimes when you're mixing up fluorescent pigments or neon pigments they tend to clump up a lot more and need to sit for a little while longer to dissolve properly because they are made insoluble through a chemical process and that can sometimes uh, hinder how easily they dissolve back into the medium. So to double up on that, pigments are insoluble, will not dissolve, dyes are soluble, they will dissolve and stain the liquid. Pigments are mostly used for paint and textile applications whereas dyes are more used for inks and paper production. So depending on what you are colouring, you would choose between a pigment or a dye. Dyes are more suitable to colouring fabrics and fibres, whereas pigments are more suitable for a top layer application as they won't stain. Now we come to the third thing and that is mica powders. Mica is a naturally occurring mineral which when crushed up into flakes or powder will reflect wa different wavelengths of light. These powders do not provide colour of their own and will need to add, have pigment added to them. However, they will reflect different wavelengths of light, so that's what we call an interference colour, but that only happens when mixed with titanium dioxide. So the varying levels of titanium dioxide on the out, outside of each particle, once it's individually coated, will create that interference colour shift reflecting that light back at us. So in summary of all of that, your pigments provide colour, they are insoluble in water, Dyes also provide colour, but they are soluble in water. And mica powders provide a shimmer and a shine, 
but they do not dissolve in water. They are insoluble and they don't have their own color. So I've got a couple of examples here of different pigments and powders and things like that. So I'll take you down for a top down view. Okay, so I've just got a plain piece of paper here. And we'll start off with a pigment. So a pigment, as mentioned above, is a color that reflects light. So here I have a pigment called ultramarine pink. And you can see that it's a very finely ground powder. That is because it is ground so fine, it's quite clumpy. And most raw pigments come in this form. Now, depending on the application you're using them for, you may need this ground more or less. And if you were to make this into paint, you would need to mull this. Now, mulling is done with a glass plate and a muller, which is a big glass uh, handle or a ball. And what you would do is you'd put this down on your glass plate and use your muller to grind that into your paint. So this is a pigment. This is an ultramarine pink pigment. And as you can see, it's flat. It doesn't have any shimmer or shine. And it is also very crumbly and very, very finely ground. So if I do this and I smooth this out, you can see that it forms a very smooth layer, but it will crack if you push too hard. Very similar texture to corn flour. Next up, we have a mica powder based color. And this will have a beautiful shimmery shine to it. This is a this little piggy pigment. And this one is called Enchanted. And straight away you can see a difference. So what this has is pigment and mica powder in it. So when I spread this out, you can automatically see that it's a lot uh, coarser. It doesn't spread out as finely as what a pure pigment does. But it's also shiny. So if I were to tilt this in the light, you can see that it's reflecting a bit of a shimmer off of that, whereas the pigment by itself next to it is matte. It's got a matte finish, whereas these uh, shimmery mica powder based pigments tend to have a glossy finish. Next up, we have our interference pigments. So the interference pigments are white based powder that can reflect different colors depending on which angle they're viewed at. This one I have here is this little piggy comet. So if I put just a little scoop down there. Now it looks white, but if I spread this out, when I spread this out, it will stay white. There is no color in this. There is no pigment added, but it is coated with titanium dioxide. So it doesn't matter how you shift or move this, it's always going to remain a white powder. However, if you look at the jar, when it's reflecting certain uh, the light waves at certain angles, this is a red gold interference color. So this will actually throw off two colors instead of one. And the effect is much more noticeable on a black background. So I've got a few interference colors here painted onto this black piece of cardboard. I've got this little piggy glisten, which is a blue-green interference. This one is sequins, which is blue-violet. And this one is comet, so the red gold. So here they display as green, blue, and red. But if you tilt them slightly, you can see the color shift from blue to pink, red to deep gold, and that green should go a nice blue color. So there is a third, uh, fourth uh, kind of pigment, or third kind of pigment, and those are chameleon colors. Now, I really like chameleon colors because they can display multiple colors in the one pigment. So these come as a powder, and this one has used a chameleon color. And you can see here that it is displaying as pink, but if I tilt it this way in the light, it goes orange. And if I tilt it this way in the light, it goes a much deeper version of orange, like a yellowy gold. And if I catch it at the right angle, you can also get it to go green as well. So here we 
we go. You can see it from uh, this camera. There's green, there's orange, there's gold, there's pink. And at the right angle, you can get all of those colors in the spectrum at once. So here is a, a great example of that. Okay, so that's chameleon colors. Now the last pigment that I have here is a duo color. So this one would be a purple based pigment with a gold based interference in it. And this one is Perlex Duo Violet Brass. So when you mix this on top of a darker background, you'll see that purple. And then as you tilt and move it, you should be able to see a bit of a gold shimmer or a brassy shimmer as that's the violet brass color. Now they're all great, they all work. Uh, you do have to dissolve them in a pouring medium before use. Now, with pigments, all pigments are opaque. They are particles. So when they bunch up together, you can clearly see here that you can't see through this. Now, what does that mean for our paintings? And what is opacity? Pigments are always opaque. Pigments mixed with mica powder can be opaque or transparent or semi-transparent. Interference colors would always be transparent or semi-transparent. And dyes are usually transparent as well. So what does this mean? So let me grab a piece of paper. And the easiest way to show this is with, with paper and baking paper. A piece of plain A4 paper is opaque. You cannot see through it, no light comes through. Whereas a piece of baking paper does allow some light to come through. So you can clearly see this blue strip here. If I were to put the baking paper over the regular paper, I'd be able to see that paper through. So to de better demonstrate, let's use a Sharpie and just draw a squiggle on here. Now, if I move the baking paper over the top, I can still see that squiggle through clearly. So this is either transparent or semi-transparent. Fully transparent would be something like a window pane where you can see clearly outside and there's no obstruction, there's no distortion. Now, if I were to put the same squiggle or thereabouts onto my baking paper and put this piece of paper on top, I can't see that second squiggle at all, which means that the paper is opaque. So likewise, I can turn that upside down like that. Now, this is a great example of the difference between pigments and dyes. So the ink used in my Sharpie marker is dye based because it's being carried in the fibers of this pen and it's being applied to the paint. And you can see that it has come through the back of this piece of paper because of the way that pigments work and they do not dissolve or meld into the substrate that you're using it on. So in this case, paper, you will not be able to see it from the back of the paper most of the time. Of course, sometimes the pigments can fall into the grains of the paper and you will see it, but most of the time that's incorrect. So here I have three paint swatches that I just did. I got some brand new paint colors the other day and just painted them straight onto here and they're fully dry. These are Matisse paints. And on the back, you can't see that pigment on the back of this piece of paper. So you can't see the red, the violet or the blue. You of course can see through it because paper isn't 100% truly opaque. But if I were to say layer this back to back, the more layers I put on, you, can, you can't see through that at all. So that's that. So that's opacity. Now I wanna demonstrate or show you uh, how pigments can fall out of solution and prove that they are not soluble in water like a dye would be. So here I have two pigments that I mixed up at the end of last year and I just haven't used them in any pores. And you can clearly see that there is a layer on top that is the color of my pouring medium. So one has stained it slightly more than the other. And I'm going to give these a mix to show you what color they actually are. So my pouring medium is this a sort of yellowy color similar to this. And you can see here, if I just move my camera down, you can see the layer of pigment separated out on the bottom. 
This is the same thing that would happen if you had mud in a cup. So I'm going to give these a mix and show you what colour they should be. So I believe this one is a greeny gold colour. Again, a pigment. And you can see as I'm mixing that, the chunks of the pigment coming up, they are not dissolved into the colour. And there we have that beautiful gold colour that was not there a minute ago. And if I leave this for another couple of months, that will dissolve straight back out. And here, I'm not sure what this colour is. Now this one's a lot harder to mix. The pigment is all stuck to the bottom. Ah, this one is an interference black red. So this pigment is a black pigment with an interference red colour added to it. So when you view the pigment straight on it will be black and when you view it from an angle it will display as red so can you see that so right there that is and these pigments have only just really entered the market there's only three colors that i know of at the moment there's red orange and like an oil slick one that displays a bit of a rainbow uh, but black pigments with the interference colors are very hard to come across so that just shows you that now these are fully mixed into the pouring medium. There we go. Okay, now just a comment on mixing, for example, two interference colours together. So I have here an interference green gold and interference blue violet, I believe. If I were to mix these two colours together, that would not result in a mixture that is green, gold, blue and violet. Because the particles are reflecting different wavelengths of light, they do not combine. So you can't just chuck two interference colours together and hope that you get, you know, a mixture of these two. It's not like mixing red and yellow to make orange. If it would, we'd have so many different colours. However, with things like chameleon pigments, the way that the pigments interact and reflect light, that's how we're able to get that amazing effect of all of those uh, different pigments all in one. They're just coated in a different way and that allows all of that light to reflect. So one particle of pigment could have multiple levels of titanium dioxide on it. And that's why we get this reflection rather than having multiple sizes of titanium dioxide in the mixture. So now just a comment on vehicles. The vehicle is what these pigments, mica powders and dye are carried in. So you're, you most definitely can use your pigments and powders as they are and dry brush them onto something, but you would need uh, a chemical bonder to go on the outside to hold it on there. So for example, if I dry brushed a box with some uh, of that ultramarine pigment, I would need to add a varnish or something on the outside to stop that from falling off. There is nothing to hold that pigment on. So if you wanted to do that, you would use a paint. A paint consists of acrylic binders and chemicals that holds everything in place. So you can make your own paint if you have powdered pigments like this. If you wanted to make a paint for brushing that is very thick and heavy body, you could use something like a heavy gel like this from Atelier. Liquitex make it, Golden make it. So a heavy gel gloss would be suitable for making a brushing paint, which you could then water down with a bit of water, a bit of varnish or something like that. You could use an untinted house paint. So whenever you want to paint your house and you get a paint chip from the store, take it up to the counter and they would color this paint. So it is untinted, which means it has no color to it. I, we use this in the Shelley Art Bloom technique. We make a pouring medium out of it. And this is what it looks like. It's sort of milky, looks a little bit like condensed milk. But when you add your pigment to it, it will change to whatever the colour of that pigment is. So as you saw before, when I mixed up these colours, these were mixed into untinted house paint. Okay, the last thing you could use is varnish. So when mixing up these pigments and powders, it's really important to disperse them first. So dispersing just means that you're breaking up that pigment into smaller bits, making it easier to dissolve into your pouring medium. 
So again, for the Shelly Art Bloom technique, we use gloss varnish. The Joe Sonia one is the one that works the best. However, you can disperse with almost any liquid that you like that is compatible with pigment. So this is the gloss varnish here. And what we do with that is just pour a little bit of the varnish into a cup, add our pigment to it, give it a good stir, and then add whatever pouring medium that we're going to use. In our case, the untinted Torben's paint. So that is the vehicle that those pigments are carried in. Imagine the pigments as people and the vehicle is the car. It's the easiest way to remember that. You've got to get some way to get that down onto your surface. So a bit more on that. Raw umber, for example, is a natural earth pigment. It's just dirt. So if you were to mix that into, uh, into water, if you were to mix raw umber into water, you would get mud. But when you mix it with linseed oil, you can get an oil paint, which will dry waterproof and it will hold its texture and shape. However, if you mixed raw umber into a watercolor mix, even after that mixture dries, you would still be able to wash it off your brush because all of those components are water soluble except for the umber. So the umber would come off, it would flake off, uh, and it would just re-dilute with the water. In acrylic paint, plastic polymers are added to apply paint and allow it to dry relatively quickly. So uh, those plastic polymers, they stay behind and they form a plastic coating that holds onto the pigment. And these three pigments in particular are very, uh, these three paints, sorry, are a matte finish. However, I have plenty of paints that are gloss finish, and that just means that they have more of those acrylic plastic binders in them without any of the diffraction medium that would cause it to dry matte like this. There are different applications for that, but that's for another time. Okay, to sum everything up, pigments are colors that are insoluble in water, which means they will not dissolve. Mica powders is finely crushed up and ground mica mineral which doesn't have any color of its own, but will reflect, refract light to give a nice shimmery shine. It is also insoluble in water. And dyes are colors that are designed to stain fibers and they will dissolve in water. You can get mica powders that are colored with pigments, as is the this little piggy line, along with a lot of other chemicals and products and things that go in there to hold everything together and make sure that it works. Uh, dyes are the same that have all sorts of products and chemicals in them to help them hold on to you know the fibers um, those products are often called a mordant a mordant m-o-r-d-a-n-t is what allows those dyes to latch on to the fibers say for example in your clothes and not let go of them it bonds them to the fibers so that's what makes dyes soluble in water Okay, so hopefully that's answered a couple of questions you may have had about pigments, dyes, and mica powders, and you've got a better, hopefully you've got a bit of a better understanding of how to use them in your acrylic work. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye, guys.